Hello everyone, my name's Fox. Once again, I am doing an unboxing of the Aya Neo. This time I'm doing an unboxing of the Founders Edition. We're going to be doing some quick looks as well again, but this time we're going to be tilting it a little bit. We're going to be addressing this in a few different ways. First things first, uh, I do have to make some corrections from the previous video. Uh, let me do a quick segue with regard to this. If you check in the description field below, you're going to see... Uh, the official links for Ioneo for their Discord, their Twitter, and their YouTube channel. If you were to go into their Discord and you were to do, do from Fox and this particular information right here, and you would see that I specifically said it months ago in November that Renoir does not support PCIe 4. Having said that, even though I had clearly said it months ago, I went ahead and just read off what I saw in the previous video. It was completely wrong. Um, again, thank you, Monster Cameron, for immediately pointing that out. It was like being, um, when he told me, I was like, no, I was right there on screen. And it was like, <laughs> oh my goodness, he's right. So I do have to make this correction. Uh, it's not that I didn't know. I was just on autopilot. So uh, Bush League mistake to make. I apologize. Do not buy PCIe 4 NVMe sticks. You're not going to get that speed out of there. Just concentrate on PCIe 3. Second correction. Um, it does not have 10 point touch. This comes from one of the few people that were talking about the INEO and they had sent me the horizon zero dawn, uh, footage in there. They had the question that I was asked was if they had 10 point multi-touch answer was yes. I was just reiterating that it does not have 10 point multi-touch. It only has five point multi-touch and we'll be able to see that later on in this video. So those are the two corrections that I needed to make. Thank you very much to monster Cameron and Chen for that information. Let's get straight into the unboxing. So there is some additional stuff here. Um, this is actually very nice. They sent like a little card and it says two Fox from Wizman. Good trip. Uh, they sent some analog stick covers, which is pretty neat. I don't typically use these, so um, I never really explored getting these, but I, I will take a look at them and see if they actually make a difference later on. This is a... I haven't actually opened this yet. So when we say unboxing, I, I, I've already been playing with the Ioneo itself. So it's kind of almost like a little bit of a... Ouch! I just cut myself. Oh, goodness. They had also sent me... Oh, that's cool. Look at that. It has, like, full instructions and everything. They give you a tempered glass cover for the Iron Neo. And this is the instructions that are included in there. That's pretty cool. And it's amazing how, like, custom these boxes get and stuff. So I will be putting that on later. Thank you very much to the IA team for sending that my way. Let's go ahead and move all this off. Now let's go ahead and get into the unboxing. Is there anything different between the... Oh, you know what? Let me, let's take a look. So this was not present on it previously. This says media, and I guess they've just been putting that on the, the boxes and stuff so that they know who needs to be get sent to if it's going for media or not. And then here there is this little bit of information, and then they did send me the one terabyte version as well, which is very nice of them to do so. Now, there are going to be some differences here, and we're going to kind of touch base on that right now. So we're going to do the unboxing, but we're going to jump straight into what the differences are for the between the Founders Edition and the, the pre-production model. So largely, this looks quite similar. So I'm going to go ahead and take that out, and we'll take a look at that in a second. Now, before we get too far into the INEO itself, there are some changes here and some things that you should immediately notice. Now, the other thing is that they did not send me a charger for the INEO, but other reviewers are getting chargers separately sent to them outside of the box. So inside the box, there is no room for it. Uh, in here, there is just a, a USB-C cable but no charger in here. But other people are getting sent chargers separately. I wasn't, but that doesn't matter because I have multiple chargers that can charge it. And then if you remember my previous video, I'll show a side-by-side -side to this. They no longer have those low-profile uh, USB-C to USB-A. They're using these uh, considerably wider versions, um, which is a little unfortunate, I think, but understandable. Maybe it was hard to source or whatever. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I'm actually going to take one of these out because I am going to need to use it when we do this. Alrighty. So once again, we're back and looking at the Founders Edition. So one of the things that should be immediately noticeable, you can see my 
see me. Hey guys, how's it going? Let's not look at me, but look at right there where it says the Ioneo founder. And you can see that this particular number is 31. So on the pre-production unit, if you go back on my video, that is not present there. Additionally, if we take a look at the um, lighting, so the first preset actually cycles through blue, red, purple, and then green. And then if you just want it to stay a solid color, it stays green on mine. So there it is, solid green. And that's what that looks like. It's pretty hard to see when there's other lights on. Additionally, um, the power usage that is pulled from the battery with these LEDs is practically nothing. I didn't see anything worth mentioning. It was negligible amount of power draw. So having these LED lights on really doesn't draw much power at all. Alrighty, now that the finished face buttons and D-pad and trigger buttons are all here, these are the mold injected buttons, no longer the 3D printed versions. I do feel a little bit more like I don't need to reserve my judgment for them anymore because this is still going to be file and all outside of, you know, the case is this is not this is a CNC uh, plastic. So it is CNC does not mold injected the case, the buttons and the triggers and the face buttons are now mold injected. So these are super final. This case, I'm not really going to touch base on yet because we've seen the white and black version. So I don't really feel like talking too much about this particular case, although it is fine, but I will start levying more criticism towards the d-pad and criticism isn't really uh the right word because i actually really enjoy this d-pad the only thing that's interesting here it is vita inspired but it all is one piece instead of um being having a center pivot that won't allow you to push down on the center so if you take a look at this and if you were to have a vita you would not be able to push directly in the center of the d-pad like this on a Vita, uh, a Vita D-pad, that is not possible. However, for all intents and purposes, it's still very good. There are tactile dome switches underneath, which you can hear. It's got really good travel. It's, it's a really good size. It's actually a little bit bigger than a Vita D-pad. And actually, if we take a look at the contour of the D-pad itself, it actually rests a thumb in really nice, and it's kind of just a nice well for your thumb to sit into. Overall, uh, a very good D-pad for a first entry from a company making a device. Really well done on here. That's that's nothing to comment on. I was just singing praises about this D-pad. This is a solid D-pad. The face buttons, the only thing that I could say is that it was present on the previous one, but I didn't know uh, to what extent it would be. For the most part, the action on the face buttons are great. It's just that this bottom south button, it might be, if we can see it here, the south button, the A button, B for Nintendo, cross for PlayStation, is actually just a scooch lower than the rest of the buttons. What happens is when we're actually using it, uh, it will bottom out insofar as you'll be able to feel the surrounding plastic uh, before bottoming out. It's not a bad thing. It's just something that I, I don't want to say feels off. It's just something that I, stood out to me. And then obviously we still have the same buttons previously. So we have the LED backlit button, which is only going to be present on the Founders Edition. When it comes to the production builds, this is actually going to be changing to a toggle button, which these other buttons will actually have uh, additional features. So you would press this and it would toggle into another mode. That is going to require software from IO to develop, as far as I know. On the bottom, this is also another change and a change for the better. So you can see these like rubber things stickied on. And here you can see the rumble model. You can also see it says 1T for 1 terabyte. It's the 1 terabyte model. These are doing a good amount of work. So right here you can see the rumble motors, but they're sitting on top of this membrane right here that is dampening the rumble motors. So if you went back to my previous video where you had heard it extremely loud, this is now completely fixed. It is a proper rumbling game controller now. Like... Perfect. It's perfect. It really is. There's good nuance to the rumble. It's not overly loud. It's not before it was literally like it was on or off, but now it actually has good nuance to the entire range of rumble that you would want out of a controller. So this is actually a, a big improvement over the pre-production model that I had 
uh, looked at previously. Along the back, this is all pretty much the same. Same battery size. We still have the inlet, the exhaust, 3.5mm jack, the LED light. This is this LED light, it's in sleep mode right now, so that's why you see it. And then you have the Type-C port, a full Type-C on the on the bottom and the top. I've already tested this, so the dock does work from this port and this port. I'll have more to say on that in a full review, but I can confirm that these ports do work as uh, for docking it. The other thing worth pointing out here is that there is like this clicky membrane that this R2 trigger pushes down on, and it does have a bit of flex here. I don't know if we're capturing that. This has the result of feeling like sometimes there is an inexact amount of feedback. Uh, so when you're pushing on it, you can actually feel it giving out a little bit. Um, in terms of feedback I'd give to the AYA group is to somehow find a way to strengthen this, uh, this place for the membrane to sit on so that it just feels a little bit more solid there. Otherwise, these are digital only triggers and they get the job done just fine. In terms of a first generation product, they really did a good job here. Before I go too far, we can actually see right here that it does say uh, five point touch. Let's go ahead and jump straight into the analog stick. Okay, so if we go ahead and just quickly take a look at these controls. Now the analogs are the big part of it. Now, if you see that I'm pressing R2, and L2, they are exactly digital. There is no analog part of it at all. If we take a look at the buttons, they all highlight just fine. If I roll my finger over it, and then rolling my finger over the D-pad, you can see the D-pad's lighting up, as well as the start and select buttons. Now, here's the thing that is worth paying attention to. So if we take a look at the left analog stick, let's go ahead and get a little bit closer there. Let me move over here just so we can see both actions. So if I do all the cardinal directions you can see that it goes to the full range however when i'm moving around you can see that it, it sticks to a bunch of different uh areas there's like there is no real analog complete analog movement here it is rather sticky and wants to snap to a bunch of different areas um so this Largely isn't that big of a deal. What I would like to see here is Aya release a controller firmware update uh, because this should be a little bit smoother and less snappy. Like when you're just moving it around, it's um, you don't notice it that much, but it, it very much wants to snap along the uh, cardinal directions. So it's very easy to go uh, northwest, southeast, and anything in between, it will go just fine. But you can see that it's it's very, very snappy in terms of its directionality and it's not so analog completely analog now if we take a look at the right stick if we take left it goes all the way left up and down but when we go right it doesn't actually go all the way right and if we take a look at the mouse look at how fast now i have this right analog mapped to the mouse using joy x off now if i were to just do left you can see how fast the mouse moves and if i did right all the way it goes slower and the reason that it's going slower is because of the mapping of the analog controller itself. Just turning off some of my studio lights just so it's a little bit easier to see. I'm not contending with as many lights already. So if we get in close here, it's easy to tell very quickly right here that it does not go all the way to the right, but on the left hand side it does. Let's just see how you can see how slow the mouse is and then left how much quicker that is. So I'm pushing all the way that I can, but the right analog stick pushing to the right, it does not go all the way. So one thing that would be really beneficial is if there was a method for updating the gamepad firmware. Um, and once again, if we take a look at the stickiness of it uh, moving in any direction, it is very, very snappy, uh, not super analog. It wants to really grip onto a few key areas where it's moving along it seems like it's trying to assist a lot and when playing games you don't really notice it all that much but there are areas that it, that it does affect things uh, additionally when you push on the right analog stick to move a camera around uh, it actually goes slower it, this could just be present on my particular model um, 
but in any event, I would like to see this particular snapping, I would say is um, the same as other Founders Edition. So that's one thing that I would like to say, even if it wasn't possible to update the Founders Edition, when this goes to full production, this is one area that I would like to see this get improved. So this is one area that I actually found a little bit interesting. Again, this is uh, Celeste. This is a game that I had played prior on the pre-production model. Now, the one thing that I do want to bring up here is specifically with the amount of power that's being used. You can see that we're using 7 watt here, and total power is 11.5 watt, uh, 11 watt. The thing that's interesting here is that some games actually do benefit greatly from stepping in. So again, let, we're seeing a look at this. It's 7 watt right now to hit 60 FPS, and that's a solid 60 FPS. But there is a bit of a disconnect in terms of sometimes the AMD platform is pushing too much power even though it doesn't need to. So if we take a look at our CPU, you can see that I was up to 4 gigahertz, went back down, and then it'll jump back up to 4 gigahertz. Uh, so it's kind of pushing a little bit too much CPU even though it doesn't need it. So one thing that we can do is we can adjust the TDP. Let me do it this way. So I'm going to push it down to 4 watts. And I'll have a how-to guide. Specifically, what I'm trying to do is this leverages um, other utilities. So I would like to just have scripts that could fire up based on certain different events. Alrighty. So you can see that I pushed to 4 watt, and if we take a look at our watt, the TDP right there, it is indeed a little bit over 4 watt, nothing crazy. But look at our total power. It went down to 6.4 watts, 6.5 watts. I'm saving around 5 watts here uh, by doing a small change. And I've been playing at length at this particular wattage, and it's been pretty much rock solid at 60 FPS. So the... There is some times that you need to step into the platform, but when you do, you can actually extract big gains out of that. So before, when we were taking around 12 watts to run Celeste, you were going to look at a little bit under 4 hours of battery life, but now with that small change, we're up to 8 hours of battery life. So with one small change, I've doubled the battery life in this one example. It doesn't work across the board. I tried Dead Cells. Dead Cells is about 4 hours of battery life. This is just something that I want everyone to be mindful of, that to sometimes extract the most amount of power out of, the most amount of efficiency out of the Aya Neo, you really are going to have to take a little bit of a deeper look. And right here I am using uh, the Renoir Mobile Tuning, which itself relies on other tools and stuff. Alrighty, if we take a look at the available sleep states that are available on the INEO, we have S3 is, it says the following sleep states are available on the system, standby S3. Uh, for what it's worth, we do want standby S3. A standby S3 is an excellent standby system to fall back on. That will make sure that the only thing that is powered is RAM and everything else will shut down. This is going to give us the maximum uh, longevity and also be able to jump straight back in the system when waking it up. So that is perfect. That looks good. Um, with regard to having the right sleep state, I also went ahead and did a 24 hour um, benchmark test. So I just had a benchmark running nonstop for 24 hours, technically 26 hours. Um, and I, the reason I'm showing you this is that for a first generation device from a new company, I often like to do stability testing just so that it's, um, peace of mind. This is a great showing here. Uh, I've had a, I've had really good uptime on the Ioneo just testing the device. There has been no problems whatsoever. So with regard to stability, it's an excellent showing from a first generation product. Uh, additionally, uh, what I did was at the end of the stability test, which was a 26 hour benchmark, which basically had a 70 degree, uh, 70 degree Celsius average temperature of the device running at 17 watt TDP for 26 hours straight. When that was done, I ran a thermal test, a uh, thermal video test to take a look at the thermals of the device. Largely, all of the heat is exhausted out of the top. So it's concentrated almost exclusively at the top of the heatsink itself. That's basically where all of the heat is. Where you hold the device is really cool. In, in fact, when you 
it looks a lot hotter when you're looking at it through the camera itself. But when you compare it against my hand temperature, you can see that my hand temperature is almost as hot as the heatsink area itself. Uh, obviously, this is the external plastic surrounding area, not the heatsink itself temperature. So that's what it's measuring. Also, a thermal camera is off, is not completely accurate. This is more just to visualize heat and what it looks like. I do have a non-contact thermometer that I have tested against a uh, ice and also boiling water, and it is actually extremely accurate. Comparing a non-contact thermometer to the temperatures that were found through the thermal camera, it was indeed off by three degrees Celsius, uh, minus three degrees Celsius, so it's actually cooler in the temps. Uh, the temps are three degrees Celsius higher recorded what you're seeing versus anything else. So one thing that was asked of me was, does the Ioneo have a portrait display? And it does indeed have a portrait display. It's not landscape. So if you try to run any older games, anything older than DirectX 9, like DirectX 8 or older APIs, you will actually have an error and you will need to fix those. Uh, I have done previous videos on how to fix these particular errors. All of these are mostly solvable. So I'm going to go ahead. You can see that we have this error right here. I'm going to go ahead and solve this right now. And there we go. So we went ahead and just fixed Abe's Odyssey. You can see that what we did, we just wrapped that older API into OpenGL here. And there's other things that you can wrap it in with DG Voodoo as well. Sometimes different wrappers are going to be necessary. Uh, but that's all that's necessary. Now, uh, this game does not work with any X input. So there would be out other things that you need to do, like either use a Steam controller config that you download from Steam to map things to the 360 controller. But by themselves, because this is just mapped as a 360 controller, nothing will actually work. So we're just going to go ahead and close this game. Ugh. Another thing to point out here is because of the large screen, but with the kind of low resolution, it can be a little bit easier to find um, what Windows has been doing for a little bit with future versions of Windows 10 is that they have been doing this thing called full screen optimizations. And we want that because you want to have something to be able to be drawn on top of a screen. Typically older apps that had full screen exclusive mode, that stuff doesn't work. Now the problem is, is that if a game is full screen, op uh, full screen exclusive, but Windows is stepping in to optimize that full screen, what happens is, is that with certain games it becomes very apparent to see uh, blur a lot easier in these instances if we had a higher resolution screen it would be less noticeable but technically everything is affected by this and what we want to do in these situations is disable full screen optimizations and it's very very easy to see with text so i'm just going to actually just show you this right now just so you can see so here is what the text looks like with full screen optimizations on okay it should be very apparent that there is like a weird aliasing going on and it just looks not crisp so like right here we have full screen optimizations enabled so if i press the virtual keyboard button the virtual keyboard comes up just as we would expect it to however all right so if i go to street fighter 5 the executable and i go to properties and I go to compatibility and I go disable full screen optimizations right there. I check that. Now what's going to happen is we will be able to have actual full screen exclusive mode and it will look super sharp. So if I go ahead and run this game again, take a look at that text. Now I'm going to show it side by side. It should be immediately apparent how much crystal clear, how much more crystal clear this text is when we disable full screen optimizations. But if we disable full screen optimizations, guess what? That virtual keyboard button no longer works because that's what exclusive full screen mode does. When you actually have real exclusive full screen mode, this virtual keyboard button doesn't work. So in games like Street Fighter, you're never going to be really using a keyboard anyway, so you don't really have much to worry about. But in a new game like Persona 5 Strikers, you do ben get benefits from doing disabling full screen optimizations, but within like 10 minutes of the game, you get asked what your name is, and then you have to use a keyboard. 
So you're going to have to pick your battles here. You should, for the most part, leave full screen optimizations on. However, you're going to have times when the screen is blurry or you will get slightly less performance. You will actually get better performance in full screen exclusive mode when you disable full screen optimizations. So these are just things that I just kind of want to point out to people just so that you're aware of what's going on and some of the things that will you'll have trouble with when you don't have an actual keyboard on the device itself. In this instance, if you wanted to carry around a Bluetooth keyboard with you, this is going to be one area where you would want to have the benefit of full screen exclusive mode where you disable full screen optimizations and then have a portable Bluetooth keyboard with you so that you can you know, use a keyboard whenever a PC game is asking you for a keyboard. That's just one thing that I wanted to kind of touch base on. I'm going to go ahead and play this game just so I can kind of have fun with the D-pad for a moment. Uh, so that's pretty much going to be the end of this actual quick look. I just wanted to kind of touch base on a few things that I didn't touch base on on my previous quick look. Uh, also to kind of compare what was going on with the Founders Edition itself. Uh, for a first generation device, this thing really is exceedingly nice. Uh, amazingly stable. Uh, it, it can't be understated that having a first device that could just withstand a benchmark running something as hard as the machine can go, in this case 17 watts, for 26 hours straight and not breaking a sweat, the thermal solution kept up, the system was stable, completely responsive through the entire way. Um, eh, I'm very, very impressed for a first generation device. You would think that just updating to the latest Radeon driver should just be standard, right? Like it should just work. Uh, there is work to be done to get that there. Remember that this is a MIPI display. We're doing EDP to MIPI display adapting. So having this work uh, as is without any problems, having it work as you would expect it to work. Uh, there is a lift behind the scenes that you may not be aware of. That's super cool. I updated the drivers. It went through without a hitch. Very, very cool. Some of the differences from the pre-production model to this new founders edition. I am overall pretty impressed with how everything came out. Uh, the only thing that I would say is a stickler is that I wish that the AYA team can find a way to update the gamepad firmware uh, remotely. If not, definitely try to update that so it's corrected for the production model. Outside of that, the stability testing of the device itself is very, very impressive. Updating drivers without a hitch, very impressive. Uh, it can't be understated for a first generation device. It is working alarmingly well and almost as good as most people would expect it to. The only thing is that I would say is playing any game before the year 2015, any PC game before 2015, you will have various degrees of issues that you will need to tackle. Steam does help this. Uh, there are methods to do Steam controller support. However, in there, you're going to have some particular issues like Condemned itself technically has no controller support. It has support via the Steam controller menu. So if you were to go to properties and go to controller, you can see that I have enabled Steam input. And with Steam input, uh, right now it detects the Xbox controller here because this pad actually is a 360 controller to the device itself. Um, so it is mapping. There's a person that has made a configuration that maps the right analog to a mouse and then this analog to WASD, WASD. Uh, and other additional buttons and potentially toggle buttons that you need to use to actually go through and play the game. Uh, this is one particular game that is actually interesting in that if we go and take a look at... So if we take a look at Condemned itself and go to properties, and then we go to compatibility, you can see that I am not disabling full screen uh, optimizations. So the virtual keyboard should work. However, when we do run the game, it doesn't. Um, so there are going to be, there are going to be some games that the virtual keypad won't work even without disabling full screen optimizations. So there are a few areas
there are a few areas that I just wanted to kind of point out that some games will be a little bit frustrating to play. I do plan on having a full review for this device in two to three weeks, and I will try to cover every gamut. I will also have it comparing uh, benchmarks against standard stuff that I've done in the past so that you can have a better idea of what to expect out of the device. Overall, it really is a great device, guys. Um, just understand its scope and where it should be working within and you shouldn't have any frustrations if you are planning to play games outside of its strengths you're gonna you're not gonna have a great time i mean that's pretty much it right so i think from everyone's point of view what they anticipate in their head to be the case is how it will operate in real life um, the only thing i kind of pointed out here is to set expectations so that you don't have any frustrations. If I just tell you that if, if you look at Steam games that have full controller support, those are the games that I would guarantee that you're going to have a great time with. And that is a tremendous amount of games. Also, pretty much the entire gamut of emulation, which I will have videos on later as well. As always, guys, thank you for your time and thanks for watching.